It has to be written all on the walls. It was a Buddhist institution, just as Oxford and Cambridge, a Christian institution, but always welcoming to any, any member of any community in the world. And that's the model in which Nalanda is to be built. And if there are problems with some of the academic institutions in India, many of us felt really alarmed as to whether that might be the case in Nalanda. And of course, having George as chancellor makes it uh, really, it's the best guarantee we could have that the original idea of Nalanda would be pursued. I think there are two elements of the original idea of Nalanda, which in some ways have very Singaporean quality. One is being open, being open to everywhere, to learn from the world. And that was a feature, uh, even some of the students. I mean, uh, Yuan Zhang, uh, Yuan Zhang, as he's written in Pin, Pin Yin now, um, mentioned that what was striking, he found, in the teaching of Nalanda, that it was always in the form of a debate. It was never lecturers bestowing knowledge but presenting a thesis, there would be a counter thesis. The day he arrived in Nalanda, he was told that a visiting lecturer has come to, why was he famous? He was famous as a debater. There was also one of the very early things to imagine that trying to pursue ideas in thinking of different ways of approaching uh, how, to, uh, how to deal with it. So openness on one side, and public reasoning on the other has been a very strong feature of Nalanda education and remains so today. If it has a lesson to offer in the world, it's a great lesson. I might say there is a Buddhist connection. Just shortly after Buddha's death, there was the first Buddhist Council, Council International held in Rajgi. Second was in Vaishali. The first one was 6th century BC. Second was 2nd century BC. The largest one was held in 3rd century BC, hosted by Ashoka in Patna, or Pataliputra, which discussed an enormous variety of things. That's most well known. But the idea that you resolve differences by discussion actually goes back to Rajgir, to the first Buddhist council. And that was indeed, that is indeed the city, the town, in which um, Nalanda is being rebuilt. It's a few kilometers from the old campus. I remember as a child, 11-year-old child, going there with my grandfather and to Rajgri, and there was something thrilling, aside from Nalanda, about, uh, I remember being told by my grandfather, this is where the first meeting took place, where people discussed how to resolve differences. The, the declaration of the intention was to resolve differences by public discussion. I think that's a major uh, new idea in the world. Uh, you know, we have to recognize how dramatically important that was in terms of the persecution that went on in Europe, in, in, in Asia, in India, and so on. But there was also this big thing, and Nalanda stood for that. And I think it has been enormously important that um, um, George's intellect, which we see in the book, in all kinds of ways, has been present. That was even before he became chancellor, uh, when he was he's been an extraordinarily indispensable member of the board, in, in how to run the institution, how to take difficult decisions, and how to proceed from there. So I really um, would like to express my appreciation of his willingness uh, to take on. It's going to be a difficult job. It is a difficult job anyway to build a university of this kind. It's a difficult job when there's political issues involved. It requires playing uh, a role that is both um, uh, constructive and at the same time uh, ability to get on with people whose ideas may not be the same as yours and nevertheless to stick for your ideas. I can't think of a greater thinker in that role than, than George. So I thank George for inviting me to come. Uh, he, he said it was nice of me to come, which is true <laughs> in some way, because it is, uh, it, it's, it's a niceness to myself. 
because I wanted to be in this occasion. Uh, not so much being nice to George, but to being nice to myself. And I have to say, it's also nice for me to be, be in Singapore, if only for one day. My life has shrunk, actually. There was a time when I went to places to give a lecture and stayed for five days or a week. And now I normally give a lecture, two lectures in one day, and, <laughs> and I have to fly. First time I came to Singapore, there was a it, there was in 1963, I just joined Dell University after having resigned from Trinity College in, in, in Cambridge, which is your college, I think. Yes, indeed. And we're proud of that. So I, I was going to give a few lectures, I think two or three, in, uh, in the ANU. And they said the journey is long, which in those days they were because trains stopped everywhere. And where would you like to break journeys? So I said I'd like to stop in Singapore and see it, because I've been hearing about it. These were very early days of Singapore's uh, miracle, as it were. And uh, I did. And I spent two days here. Uh, and uh, it was my experience trying to understand what is going on. And I think I formed the view, which of course Singapore has fascinated me, uh, came back to me often. And when I had the privilege of meeting Lee Kuan Yew, a number of times. Uh, we sometimes discussed, and he gave me a copy of, uh, the, uh, of the Singapore story. And actually, I earned that privilege by being critical of him. I had criticized him, saying I didn't agree with his idea of democracy, didn't agree with his idea of Asian values. And then he suggested when I landed in Singapore, first time, that was, no, that was not first time, 63 wasn't. But when I came next time, uh, I was told that uh, if I wanted to see him, I could, and of course I wanted to see him and went there. And we chatted a long time. I think when I think about it, and I had to think about it recently because I was asked to speak about, uh, uh, about Lee Kuan Yew when it was clear he was very ill, and something was recorded from me, which actually BBC did broadcast as one of the obituaries uh, coming from someone who had uh, interlocuted with him, but also tried to interpret the genius. And I think it's a genius which my country in India is greatly in need of at this time. I see, it, you see, everyone has their own theory, and of course, I'm not surprised that Kishore has a theory on that subject uh, as to what happened in, in Singapore. And by the way, one only thing that was surprising was that I think Kishore is completely non-invisible. Whereas initially there seemed to be some problem in seeing it. After having dinner with you when I went back home and after a little while I went to bed, I opened the television. There you were, chatting away with John Major. So anyway, you couldn't be, couldn't be escaped. <laughs> you were suddenly there. And I learned something from your story. But there's another more ideological story, I think. I think it's a story the origin of it is, could be traced to be non-Asian, namely it's Adam Smith. You see, Adam Smith, the wealth of nation, and uh, you know, I'm a bit of a Smith uh, fan, and indeed the theory of moral sentiment I strongly recommend, other than wealth of nation, that great book too. The, the, my edition of theory of moral sentiment, which is the Penguin edition, where Rob wrote a long introduction. I discuss what he is he's trying to say this is 1759, and then comes 1776, the, the, uh, the Wealth of Nations. And he is trying to say two things, that exchange is very important, and production and consumption and prosperity depends on successful trade and exchange. So you have to pay attention to that, and you need the market for that. He's also saying that the role of the state which supplements the market economy, which you cannot escape. And one way he said, why is it that we want good political economy? And he said, the answer is that good political economy leads to fast economic expansion. That increases everyone's income, number one, allowing them to do more things that they would like to do. And number two, it increases revenue in the hand of the government, state of the commonwealth, as he put it. Allowing the state to do those things 
which the state alone can do well and ought to do, like public education, public health care. So I think this combination of market on one side and the responsibility of state in educating everyone and providing arrangements for health care, I think that combination is enormously important. And I say that if you look at the last two numbers of The Economist, you will see that India has one of the lowest immunization rates. The state of Gujarat has a lower immunization rate within India than they are. Uh, it's actually one of the lowest in the country. And similarly about basic education. I think we have enormous amount to learn. And to learn from Singapore only that the market economy is important. And not to learn that public services are tremendously important too. And it's that combination which Smith was longing for. I think is a very much a central feature of the Singapore story. And this is a view from an outsider who tried to observe Singapore intermittently from 63 onwards, seeing it go with pride because of the fact that even though I've never been a Singaporean, there was something in the combination. Of, you know, the moment you phrase public sector, public services, people say you must be anti-market, which is terrible. And if you're for market, then you say, leave everything behind. I mean, that's what we're trying to do in India. There's no health service, basically, worth speaking of. And giving cash and throwing money is not a substitute for arranging a health, health system, education system. That's where I think the great lessons uh, are. So I always enjoy an opportunity of coming back and seeing what's happened in the next stage of the Singapore story. So thank you very much, George, for giving me this opportunity, which has uh, I appreciate greatly, and of course, I'm thrilled by having the chance of being with you and this wonderful woman of the publication of a very great book. Thank you. <laughs>